this tutorial we're going to cover cooling. We have touched on cooling as we went along, but I've direct I've avoided focusing on it entirely because it is one of those complicated subjects and setting it up and using it efficiently is tricky. To actually just do a ghetto cooling setup is pretty easy. We've already covered one already where you run some granite pipes around a coal biome, the oxygen goes through, comes out the other side and it's always colder. But we had no control over that. We didn't know how, what temperature the oxygen was going to come out at. There's a lot of problems with those type of ghetto setups. And what I want to demonstrate here is how you can actually, with not too much effort, really fine tune the control so that you actually have some power. You know exactly what temperature your oxygen is going to come out at, regardless of how much you pass through. Well, not quite regardless, but close enough. And you'll also be able to have a good idea if you're actually applying too much cooling or you're drawing too much cooling from your anti-entropy nullifier or whatever cooling device you use. We'll cover anti-entropy nullifiers. Uh, later on, I'm going to cover aqua tuners and steam turbines. But uh, you could end up, for example, drawing too much cooling from your anti-entropy nullifier and you wouldn't know until suddenly your oxygen's too hot. So we're going to cover, this allows us to apply some level of control so that we know what's going on. I dislike just running a bunch of pipes around one of these and then what temperature my oxygen comes out at will depend on how much oxygen I put through, how long the pipes are, how long my electrolyzer has been running for, how hot the oxygen is going in, um, how many duplicants I have. It, all that causes too many variables and since I have no control I'll end up having to either increase the pipe length or decrease it. Mm, all messy. So let's get down to actually doing a controlled setup, one where we have the power to manipulate the temperature as we see fit. Uh, so all we have over here is a standard issue ice box, basically a box full of cold. How you make it entirely up to you, anti-entropy nullifier, wheeze warts, aqua tuner, all of these are viable methods of creating an ice box. Uh, I'm using an anti-entropy nullifier here because we, we didn't really get a chance to cover it during the previous tutorials because I was trying to do a map resistance start and I wanted to show you how to get to endgame without relying on things you may not find. But if you do find one of these, they're quite easy to exploit and they're quite useful for setting up uh, your electrolyzer in a permanent fashion relatively early on in the game. Uh, these things run on hydrogen, so they go hand in hand in electrolyzer setup. The excess hydrogen you're going to kick off you're going to have plenty left over even after, even if it's a self-powered electrolyzer setup, the amount of excess hydrogen you get will handily power this device. As well as that, this thing has a, a freeze temperature of minus 173. It goes down quite chilly. Uh, its heat production is minus 80 uh, units of heat. And this is regardless of the atmosphere. So I've put hydrogen in here because I was going to have excess hydrogen kicked off by my uh, electrolyzer. You could have oxygen in here. It wouldn't actually make a difference. I like to use hydrogen though. It has a bit more thermal capacity. It's just, it's a standard. Now, once you have your ice box set up, then we use a standard issue thermal injector. We've used these many times, but I'll just go over it again. Metal tiles, usually gold or copper. Uh, tungsten also works, but tungsten is best saved for volcanoes. Anything to do with really high temperatures, tungsten's better. Copper and gold, still relatively common and easy to use. I would avoid using iron and steel. They're slightly less conductive, and there's usually better uses for them. The door itself is made of steel. For thermal injectors, you always need to use a steel door. It's the only conduct door that's good at conducting... Uh, that has good thermal conductivity. All the rest are just terrible, absolutely terrible in comparison. And then over here we actually have what we're chilling. Now I fill this up with water instead of hydrogen. I'll explain that later, but all that's happening is the oxygen from our electrolyzer setup is coming in here, passing through these radiant pipes and then passing out the other side. So it passes through here and ends up chilling. So it's coming in at 50 degrees, exiting at 27 roughly. So 50, 51 to, drops from 51 degrees to 27. Now these radiant pipes are made out of copper. Copper is not the best radiant pipe material. However, early on in the game, which is about when you'll be setting this up, it probably will be the best thing you have access to. And this is just all the radiant pipe types you can build. 
gold amalgam, which you think would be great, is actually terrible. Thermal conductivity of four. Uh, iron comes in second at number eight, twice as good as gold. And then you've got copper, which comes in at number nine, which is quite decent. Then you've got wolframite, which comes in at an amazing 30. So wolframite's actually quite useful. And if you find some wolframite in the coal biome, which is quite likely, just putting in a few of these is quite handy. It's just wolframite is one of those very rare materials. You'll only end up with about 40 to 80 tons on the whole map. It's not replaceable. You can't find it in space. Yeah, it's difficult to get. But if you want to use some wolframite in there, perfectly reasonable. And last, but definitely not least, is steel. Comes in at an amazing 108. That's 100 points higher than uh, iron. So, quite amazing. But for this setup, we're just going to use copper ore because it'll be relatively plentiful and easy to get your hands on at the start. Uh, and it's, it's quite doable. You don't even have to replace this later if you don't want to. If you want to use wolframite, though, go ahead. Now, one of the downsides of using copper, though, is because it's not quite as conductive as some of the better materials, this is going in at 50, coming out at 27, and we have the temperature currently set in here to 22. So it's not quite chilling down as much as the target was. However, that's not really a big problem. All we can do is we can simply set the temperature of this even lower, and then, well, this will come out at a much chillier temperature. So just say we want to target, instead of 27, we want to aim for 25 degrees. So let's just drop this another two degrees. And as you see there, door closes. And now it starts injecting the chill. Now, this water has quite a lot of thermal capacity, so it will take a little bit of time for it to drag the temperature down. But you can see there, let's speed this up a bit. As you can see, it's going to slowly drop the temperature. We're at 21.9, 21.8, and it will keep going. All right, so I'll just skip ahead in time here, and we'll get around to it when it's just about ready to, to top out. All right, so it's just bottomed out there, and the door opened there a few seconds ago. And as you can see, water's down to 20 degrees. And our oxygen is now coming out at 25. So we've dropped the output temperature by about 2 degrees just by changing the temperature in here. This is quite handy. This is the whole reason you would set one of these up and actually go to the bother of making a thermal injector on one of these. We're now controlling precisely how chilly the oxygen is when it comes out, which is excellent. I, I had problems over chilling my base at one point. Maybe you have problems, maybe you'll end up uh, with overchilling yourself or end up in those situations where people end up with their oxygen too cold and then they end up having to run it through a caustic biome to heat it up again before they bring it back to their base. But then, of course, something changes or they add more duplicates and then they have to change the piping again. No. If anything changes, you just come here and you reset the temperature to something else. Right now, we are just pumping through uh, one kilo of oxygen per second. So that will support 10 duplicates. However, if we had, say, well, if we only had seven duplicates, we might not need to set the temperature this low because it'd only be about 700 grams of oxygen going through here a second. So this just allows us to adapt on the fly. If our needs change, we just change the thermostat. That's it. No messing around with pipelines, no actually doing physical changes. It's just a quick case of, oh, I've added another duplicate. I might want to adjust the temperature. I'll have a quick check. That's it. This is the power of having one of these setups. And this is why pretty much anything to do with temperature, you're going to use one of these little thermal injectors for pretty much anything, for the control it gives you. Now, before I get on and uh, start going into aqua tuners and uh, steam turbines and things like that, uh, I'd like to cover why there's only water in here. It's actually... <laughs> actually very reasonable why we want to use water in here because if we put hydrogen in here let's uh bring this up for a moment yeah, after a bit of playing about there um the reason we don't put in just hydrogen is with two kilos of hydrogen when this door engages the heat, the temperature that's going to get shifted across just watch this temperatures minus is currently 21 by the time the door disengages we're down to 12 oh no that's five hasn't actually got up three yeah the problem is hydrogen injects, the, the hydrogen can't actually absorb all the chill that's being thrown at it. So what happen, ends up happening is the temperature in here plummets well below our target temperature. The doors are not exceedingly fast. The response times on the temperature sensors are not quite quick enough. It, it takes it a tick or two to update. So when it realizes that the temperature's hit the correct amount, it tells the door to close. 
but or the door's open. By the time all that's happened, it's dumped so much chill in there that yeah, we've we've started messing with how cold the oxygen should be. It's coming out way colder than we wanted. You're better off just using water. It takes a little bit more time to adjust the temperature up and down, but at least once it's adjusted, it's stable, reliable, and dependable. And finding polluted water early on is not that hard. It's all over the caustic or not the caustic biome, the slime biome. Absolutely riddled with it. So six tiles of polluted water, not that hard to get your hands on. Alright, now we're going to have a look at probably the most effective way of destroying heat. Well, legally destroying heat. And that is to use a thermo aqua tuner. Now, thermo aqua tuners don't actually destroy heat. The steam turbine is going to do that. But what they do do is they move heat around. And by that I mean every time you pass a liquid through it, it removes 14 degrees of heat from that liquid 10 kilos at a time and effectively absorbs that heat into the mass of the aqua tuner and the aqua tuner is quite bulky it's uh, 1.2 kilo 1200 kilos so 1.2 tons of mass in an aqua tuner so it can soak up that heat now we do have to dispose of it but for the time being it's just good to know that any liquid that passed through here loses 14 degrees of temperature now liquids have different heat capacity so if we look at this water here this water has a heat capacity of 4.179 this is much higher than say something like petroleum or crude oil they have much lower heat capacities about half roughly so this is going to generate an awful lot more heat so to dispose of that heat what we're going to do is use the the magic of the steam turbine now they covered there's ways to cheat with steam to, to not cheat uh, there's ways you can manipulate the game engine to use steam turbines to create free energy or things like that. We're going to avoid using that and we're just going to try to use it as, as legal legally as possible and avoid the street legal, so to speak. Now, what's happening here is this is just powering an icebox. This is one of the more expensive types of icebox to make in terms of it actually has have a liquid pump in here. There are other versions, I'll cover that in a bit, that don't require a liquid pump and can still provide relative cooling, but this is a... In this one, we're just going uh, the whole hog. So right now, the liquid from here is being pumped up, sent through the aqua tuner. Uh, it comes out cooler than it went in. So it's coming in 74.5, and uh, it's popping out at 60.6. Yeah, 60.5 now. And then it goes down here, mixes with the rest of this water, and this pump then picks it back up and sends it back up again. And we have a little temperature sensor here to tell it when it hits zero degrees to stop. Actually, just to make things extra safe we're gonna stick in some diamond temperature shift plates not really necessary but it's, I, I'm a big fan of diamond temperature shift plates now up here to deal with the heat what we've done is we've placed some water in here now what's gonna happen is when the heat this heats up too much it's gonna cause this water to turn up into steam and this aqua tuner is made out of steel so it can survive up to 325 degrees of temperature however not good enough we also have to worry about these gas pumps up here these gas pumps are going to recirculate the steam that pops at the top and send that steam right back down to the bottom again now they don't have a hope of keeping up with the steam turbine uh, to run a steam turbine fully like a legal legal i think it takes about 20 it would take about 20 gas pumps to keep it running constantly to move the steam back down again these things are rather hefty they move two kilos of steam per tile so it's two four six eight yeah it's ten kilos of steam these things can handle processed ten kilos of steam per second yeah we we haven't got a hope but the amount of heat this destroys per operation is unbelievable it takes in steam at a minimum amount uh, what's the yep 226.9 degrees and then it spits it at the other side at about 150 or 154 I'm not sure the exact figures but it's an enormous amount of heat destruction. So all we're going to do is wait until this heats up the water. Oh, it's just getting there now. Once that turns to steam, and then once that steam gets to 230 degrees, 26.9 degrees, that will start processing, and this will start actually actively destroying its own heat. And this box should keep getting colder. So I'm just going to skip forward in time a bit until that's about ready to kick in. Oh, actually, before that's ready to kick in, I just want to show you how you, uh, you set these up. The uh, first thing you're going to want to do here you're going to want to put in about 250 kilos of water at the bottom. That's the minimum you want to aim for. You can put in a little bit more, but I try not to go too high for reasons that will become obvious later. Normally what you do is you leave this open at the bottom. 
say here you just put in a, a vent a liquid vent and a hydro sensor so there's one two three four five six there's six tiles there actually yeah let's just put it there put in a vent there and then there's five tiles 250 so set the hydro sensor to about 50 kilos and have it shut itself off once this has hit 50 kilos all the long way along the bottom you'll go a little bit over you'll probably go up to 300 but it will make a big difference and once that's done you roll it up like this and you'll set the fans to come on and then what you'll happen is you'll have the gas pipes come out like this and you're going to have your high pressure vent here and then at the same time you're going to have another pipe coming out here with a high pressure vent and get rid of that gas pipe so now what we'll do is we will turn on these by changing the, the pressure threshold here and these gas pumps will vacuum out this whole area we don't want any oxygen in here so this will vacuum out the whole area for us because we've got that gap there once these gas pumps have vacuumed out the whole area all we do at that point finish off the gas pipes you should all be insulated by the way so we'll finish off the gas pipes which we can do from the outside delete that then replace this tile because you can build the agni deconstruct this tile and well yeah build it all the way down and then we've got the a sealed vacuum in here with our water at the bottom ready to go and uh, one last thing to realize is this temperature sensor that's hooked up to this it's set to 265 degrees you want to put this on the bottom because if you put a temperature sensor in a vacuum you can't ever do anything with it no matter what you set the temperature to it won't change states it will if it's active it'll stay active it's, if it's inactive it'll stay inactive if it's in a vacuum it effectively is unaffected by temperature so we leave this on the bottom so that it's in the water and the water actually has a temperature which means we can actually turn it up and down this way when we're setting it up we can turn it off and then when we're ready to go and actually heat things up we can adjust the temperature and apply it uh, I like to use a couple of temperature shift plates here just to make sure that the, the thermostat is accurate because I don't want to go above 275 degrees otherwise I'm going to start damaging these fans uh, you, you might think well there's any cool steam coming at the top true but the con conductivity of this steam turbine is 54 which means it normally transfers the heat really really quickly which means the steam up here is going to end up only a few degrees colder than what's down here anyway you're better off just playing it safe and i'm a big fan of diamond temperature shift plates so anyway this is uh, still not hit capacity yet i'll pause the video here and i'll come back to you when this is about ready to spin up all right so we finally hit temperature and as you can see here this is just starting to spin up processes a little bit and then immediately shuts off and our gas turbines kick in and start pumping all the steam right back down again and they will keep processing until the gets to two kilos or less of pressure of course this thing kicks in again causes more steam to go up they kick on again and this will continue back and forth but as you can see down here this is still getting cooler and cooler and cooler and cooler and it just keeps going so long as you keep providing this with power it will keep destroying heat for infinity it's effectively a way of turning electricity into cooling it's pretty much the only way to turn electricity into cooling that i'm aware of now this is still going to cost you a fair bit of energy you're running an aqua tuner here these things are, are not cheap at 1200 well yeah 1200 kilowatts or 1.2 kilowatts that's a lot of energy but the ability to actually churn out enormous amounts of cooling is intensely powerful now you're still also going to be running these two gas pumps to run an aqua tuner pumping water through you're effectively going to end up running these two gas pumps constantly which is an extra 240 watts per uh, per actual gas pump so you're looking at about 480 watts just to keep those two pumps running constantly and even then they will not be able to keep up with the steam output from down here water has just has too much of a heat capacity so i've tested this before it works out at about 95 percent of the time it'll give you about 95 percent uptime on your aqua tuner 
and it will take a little bit of time to get up there. You can tweak it a little bit more, but let's see what's this set to. Yeah, these uh, gas pumps can go up to 275 degrees before they hit overheat, so you can normally redline this by putting it up to 275, and yeah, that'll get you to about 95%. I usually try and avoid doing that, and uh, yeah, I usually try and avoid doing that just in case because I like to make these things maintenance free. And how have I managed to draw too much power? One second. One of the other advantages of this is uh, all of this equipment, the pump, uh, the liquid pump, the two gas pumps, and the thermal aqua tuner, they all come to a total energy draw of 1.92 kilowatts, which means so long as you run it on its own wire, it won't overload a conductive wire, which is quite useful. Uh, as well as that, what I have done here is I have this steam turbine hooked into the grid, now, honestly, it's not going to run at an awful lot of energy. I think it's about 1% of the total draw of this entire thing will be covered. The only reason we really have it plugged in is if you don't have a steam turbine, have the steam turbine connected to a power wire, it won't actually turn on. So you might as well just connect it up. Uh, secondly, when it comes to the gas pipes, you want to use ceramic is preferable. Uh, as well as that, you want to make sure you don't put in too much water, otherwise you could end up with 20 kilos of pressure down here and 20 kilos of pressure up here, and you'll have no way of actually getting the steam to recirculate again. So try and get 250 kilos of water total. 300 is not going to be the death of you, it's just it gets annoying. The more you have in there, the less range you'll have to work with. I'll show you some that I've messed up a bit later. Now, this is basically your number one heat destruction device. It, it will destroy far more heat than Weezworts ever will, or, well, not ever will, but it will destroy heat f an awful lot faster than Weezworts will, and an enormous amount faster. You can cool things a lot faster with this, and since it only takes power, they're pretty flexible. And you can just literally make this box, put this box a distance away, done. Uh, the device has now hit zero degrees down here so this is uh, shut off it got up to about 270 didn't quite max out the machine but yes this effectively just ate all the heat out of those six tiles this effectively ate all the heat out of those six tiles of water it started about 70 or 80 degrees i believe and now all that heat has been destroyed consumed by the steam turbine effectively all for the cost of some electricity now if you want to cut down on the cost of running one of these things what you could do is instead of using these two pumps, you can use a door pump system. Uh, a door pump system, it's street legal. No one, it, you can pretty much use them anyway. And uh, this will allow you to recirculate the steam without the cost of these two gas pumps up here. And it works pretty effectively. A uh, second option is you can flood this upper chamber with uh, hydrogen or oxygen. And this will fool the machine into thinking that the steam, that, that, that there's no steam here, uh, that the pressure is low enough for the steam to go up and that oxygen will simultaneously force the steam down. You'd actually leave a gap here, so the steam can come back down again, and this will basically mean the oxygen will force the steam down to recirculate it, and it will effectively obliviate the need for gas pumps as well. So there are ways to make this cheaper. I'm just going with what I believe is uh, solid, as in I doubt this will be patched out. I mean, it's possible they might modify the steam turbine and make it less effective, or God knows, more effective. Uh, but this system should still continue to function regardless of any patches they put out. Uh, gas door pumps should also remain fairly stable, I'd imagine. But uh, putting a different type of gas up here to trick this device may not remain viable long term. So here's one of those steam turbine cooling systems put in place in my actual live playthrough. Now, this here is actually cooling a petroleum icebox. Uh, there's a reason for using a petroleum ice box, even though it's less energy efficient. And by that I mean, well, let's grab the petroleum there. If you look at the specific heat capacity, it's far, far less than water. Water has 4.1, I believe, and let's see, 4.179. Petroleum is just, it's not even close. So the amount of energy I'm spending on, or the amount of electricity I'm spending on this thermal aqua tuner to chill petroleum, it seems like it's a waste. However, there are instances where you will want to cool petroleum instead, namely because of the freezing point of petroleum. It's minus 57. 
when it comes to cooling, you'll notice a lot of people using polluted water. That's because polluted water has a freezing temperature of minus 20, whereas clean water has a freezing temperature of zero. So it gives you 20 extra degrees of temperature to play with with your cooling solutions. Petroleum, however, has a freezing point of minus 57, which means I can chill this down to, what have I got it set to, minus 40. So I've set this to minus 40. If you go down below the freezing point of a liquid and that liquid happens to be in a pipe, that pipe will take damage and the liquid will break out of the pipe. This is bad because then it requires maintenance. And usually those pipes, these ones here, let's say, are in very difficult to access areas. Also, they might start dumping liquids into places you don't want them. So you want to make sure that your temperature sensors are set to uh, give them a little bit of a margin for error so you don't accidentally end up freezing your liquids. For example, if you look here, this liquid has been sent at minus 39 and it's coming back at minus 53. So yeah, we're, we're, we're coming a scooch close, but it's stable, it's reliable. So that's the temperature. If you're using petroleum, uh, I suggest minus 40 is good. Uh, you could probably squeeze an extra degree or two out of it, but I just wouldn't recommend it. But the reason we're using petroleum is because this allows us to get such, it allows us to go down to minus 39, close to minus 40. And we need that because we're really trying to chill this whole area down. That's why I'm willing to take the energy hit to give myself more of a spread on the cooling I'm trying to achieve. If this ice box was only hitting, you know, minus three, it, it wouldn't be able to spread out the cooling nearly as far. I would be spending less energy, but I wouldn't be getting the cooling solution I'm looking for. So there are instances where you're better off using a different liquid. Uh, the perfect liquid to use here, of course, would be super coolant, but too early in the game to have access to that. And by the time I get access to it, I won't actually care because I, I already have so much excess power, it's, it doesn't make a difference. Now, there is an option, a version of this, that does not use a liquid pump. Uh, we'll go up here. And this is where we're using one. This is one where I made lots and lots of mistakes because I forgot to look at previous diagrams and it's a perfect example of all the mistakes you can make and should avoid. Okay. First up, the cooling solution, instead of actually using a liquid pump, we just use uh, pipes. So the pipes rotate through here. What happens is the liquid comes through, hits this tank here and starts dumping its cooling into this, well, this box of water, basically. Uh, and this is our ice box. This is hooked up to a a steam vent it could be anything though you could have this hooked up to anything but this only needs this only needs to be below 60 degrees it, it only takes a, an ice box below 60 degrees to keep a, a steam vent tamed so i don't really need it to be that chilly but i unfortunately set this to 20 degrees i think when i first started which was a mistake on my part i, I thought i'd put polluted water in here and i set it a little bit lower than i should have and it damaged the pipes i've actually put clean water in these pipes because i wasn't thinking clearly if you put polluted water in these pipes, it would probably be a safer plan. But this is a, an energy cheaper way of providing cooling because you're not wasting those 240 watts on running a liquid pump to run the liquid back and forth. Just a few radiant pipes and some ceramic piping here. Done, problem solved. Now, some of the other mistakes you're going to make is, let's say you forget to put in an Atmos sensor. And by the time you realize you've already sealed it up, well, you're going to end up with even more problems. <laughs> Don't forget the Atmos sensor. Now you notice there's only one gas pump in here. This is because this provides so little cooling to run this that it doesn't actually need two gas pumps. So I ripped one out. Of course, I also ripped out the Atmos sensor by accident because I forgot about it. Now, because I have no Atmos sensor, this will literally keep pumping steam until, well, until there's no steam left or until the pressure down here hits 20 kilos. So once the pressure down here is 20 kilos, the steam pump can't keep pumping steam down here but what that will cause is it will cause the steam to stay in the pipes and because the steam stays in this pipe it has a an annoying habit of interacting with things around it and eventually cooling down to a point where it can actually solidify back to liquid and damage the pipes so to help avoid that double layers of insulation always great but also another thing to keep an eye out for is where you place your power wire, because I placed my power wire on the exact same axis as the gas. And those power wires are called conductive wire for a reason. It's actually quite conductive. So you'll end up soaking heat out of the um, out of the gas pipe, and 
and that will actually hasten you ending up with more damage to your piping. So this was terribly constructed and I really need to do it all over again. So to sum up, don't forget the Atmos sensor. Try and keep the water in the that you put in the base to 250 degrees. Put the Atmos sensor in the water to start, otherwise you're going to have even more trouble starting it. Um, don't put the power wires and the actual ventilation pipe on the same axis because they, they exchange heat far too well for my liking. And for the actual piping that you run through here, try and put polluted water in it to give yourself more of a margin for working with. And these systems that don't have the pump, they're designed for more low throughput systems that don't actually need massive temperature differentials. Uh, by and large, try and run polluted water or water always through the AquaTuner. The only time you're not going to do that is when you want something that goes really low temperature. And you better have a need for that really low temperature, otherwise you're just wasting electricity. But if you've got lots of excess power, not a problem. So yeah, these cooling solutions will spring up everywhere. Now I'm going to show you one where I'm using it as a multi-purpose solution. Okay, this is a little bit of an awkward solution, but uh, due to an inconveniently placed volcano, I had to alter where I was placing everything, which gave me less space to work with. This cooling solution here is cooling this ice box over here. And this ice box is full of polluted water. This polluted water is connected up with a couple of thermal injectors to this tank. This is actually the main water tank for my base. Well, for my non-exosuit part of my base. This is my chill water tank for, well, crops if I had any, uh, toilets, uh, science, that kind of stuff. So this water wants to be about 23 degrees. So that's what I've said it to. I've basically hooked up an ice box to my cool water tank. When I want more water, uh, I've actually turned it off for the moment because I'm running low on polluted water. I just hook up polluted water through here and I just dump it right on top. Now, as we covered in the petroleum boiler, the liquid I drop out of here will drop straight down and won't stop until it hits a tile or a solid surface. So it will land right here on top of the, well, the icebox thermal injector right beside the thermostat. Once the temperature gets noticed, injectors kick in and it will chill the water. This ensures that I end up with a nice chill tank of water. Now, it's not just doing that though. Over here you'll notice I've got my electrolyzer set up. The oxygen from my electrolyzer setup is actually piped through my uh, my water tank. So I'm piping it right through here. It comes out the other side at about uh, 24.8 degrees Celsius. So it leaves here at 62. So effectively all the heat from the oxygen I'm creating in my electrolyzer setup is being dumped into my central water tank which is then being taken care of by my icebox. So effectively the heat is somehow ending up over here eventually and being destroyed. So it's cooling my oxygen and cooling my main water tank. And then on top of that, because iceboxes are so useful, I'm also running water through here. This is some uh, pipe that's passing through here. It's a radiant pipe made of gold. And this radiant pipe is then feeding around here. Uh, it basically weaves its way left to right, back to the middle, all the way up through the base. And then when it gets to the top, it does the exact same thing the other direction. Now, this pipe here is just granite. It's granite piping all the way. So it weaves its way all the way through my base before eventually coming back, passing through the radiant piping, and then back out on its way again. And I just fill this up from my main water pump through these, uh, through this device here. Now, this system is not going to provide perfect temperature control, namely because these are just granite pipes. They're not going to exchange heat perfectly well. I mean, they're reasonable. Uh, thermal conductivity of 3.39. It's a very small amount. However, there's an enormous amount of them. There's a really, really an enormous amount of them, and they go everywhere. So by and large, the entire base is going to end up between... Let's see what temperatures come at it. Uh, yeah, there's tw it's coming out at 24 degrees or 23.5, and it, by the time it makes it back to the water tank, it's 
So it is soaking up heat from throughout the entire base, absorbing it into the liquid and dumping it back down here. So think about it, it's a kilo of, or 10 kilos of water a second and it's gone up in temperature by about uh, a degree. So everywhere is going to end up nice and, well, thermally stable. And the hotter things get, the more likely they are to keep dumping uh, heat into the pipes. So there'll be a few areas that go a little bit higher, like 27 and stuff like that, especially around transformers. But the moment you get a few tiles away, it all drops back down to 24, 25 degrees. So this is an eat. So this is with one simple ice box. You can cool both your oxygen, cool your whole base, and cool your main water tank. And I can basically just dump sieved water in here. 40 degrees sieved water will get dropped in here. And so long as I restrict the flow to five kilos, which one sieve will do, the ice box can perfectly keep up with that and with the oxygen and with the base cooling. This is just a nice all-in-one solution and really shows the power of steam turbines. That's just one steam turbine eating all that heat. True, it'll cost you a lot of electricity, but so long as you put together a decent power source, and I mean, I'm, I'm swimming in petroleum right now, I don't really care. It's quite easy to provide enormous amounts of cooling on a large scale and really just ease your way into the late game. A few pieces I forgot to mention. Oh, I forgot to mention the control system on this. Uh, this here is a liquid pipe thermo sensor. It basically detects the temperature of the liquid in the pipe it's on top of. You, know, you can't place these on tiles, they have to be placed in an empty square. You can't place them on ladders or anything like that. It just has to be an empty square and a pipe. Uh, so this detects the temperature of the liquid inside, and once it wins, it goes below 22. Oh, sorry, once it goes above 22, it then sends a signal through here. Uh, this is an AND gate. The reason it's an AND gate is I don't want this aqua tuner turning on if the temperature in here is above 275 degrees. Well, about 270, I'm being safe. If the temperature in here is above 270, I don't want it getting hot, any hotter because it would damage the, the gas pump. And I also don't want it turning on if the temperature of the liquid in here is below 22 degrees. And these things are finicky. I can't stress how finicky these are enough. Sometimes they'll let liquid too that's actually well below 22. I don't know, it's like they have a, a glitch or lag out every so often. So I try and keep the temperature quite a, quite a decent bit above what it needs to be. Also, to fill this system, it may look complicated to actually fill it up, but it's not. All I actually did to fill this one, liquid bridge, and that's it. I brought in a pipe full of liquid, plugged it into there, and the liquid bridge basically dumps it on. These liquid bridges are one way, so the water can't ever get back up, and I just leave it there until the whole pipe system is full, and you're done. And that's it. That simple. There these things very handy and very useful for taking care of cool steam vents.